can I then invite you to turn your Bibles to that verses we read in Luke's Gospel, Luke chapter 13. We will focus tonight upon verses 6 to 9. I read the earlier verses in order to provide some context, and I may well make a passing reference to them. But you will know that the preacher last Lord's Day evening preached a solemn sermon from the first five verses of Luke's Gospel, so I don't intend to preach from that part. Plus the fact that I have already preached from that section of Scripture on a previous occasion in the party congregation. But I would like this night to look at verses 6 to 9, a parable that Jesus told following the verses that are written for us there, verses 1 to 5 in chapter 13. The title I would like to give to the meditation tonight is The Barren Fig Tree. The Barren Fig Tree. I'm certainly of the opinion that when this was first uttered by the Lord Jesus, he certainly had the Jewish church in mind. And this would be in keeping with what we read earlier in Matthew's Gospel concerning the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. That we do believe is a reference to the Jewish church at that time. And it was spoken at the time when the Pharisees and the Sadducees came to John's baptism. We know so much about John that maybe we take a lot of things for granted, but John was a remarkable preacher. He had a remarkable amount of success in the sense that people thronged to him. He didn't have a building. He didn't have a comfortable building. He didn't have a pulpit. He had none of the many modern props that preachers have today. He was in a wilderness, in a desert-like place, not completely sandy and barren, of course, but it was a hostile place. Yet we are told that they came from all over Jerusalem, Judea, all to hear John the Baptist preach. And he wasn't a man-pleaser. He didn't go out to flatter people. He told what we might accurately describe as the covenant people of God. He told them that they had to repent. Now that message would be very, very acceptable if he preached that in front of the Jews to the Gentiles. The Jews would happily go along with John's words. They would endorse it. They would give it their full approval. To think that the Gentiles had to repent was customary. It was widely accepted amongst the Jews. They were the Jews. They were the highly privileged people. But to tell them, the covenant people of God, the Jews, and to tell the Pharisees and the Sadducees, who were the religious leaders of the day, that they had to repent was something unheard of. But he preached it. And he had remarkable success. And many submitted to his baptism. And we're inclined to believe that the Sadducees and the Pharisees, these religious people, came out merely to observe. Because they did not submit to his baptism. But they were wondering what was happening. Here were throngs of people going out to this desert place to hear an unconventional preacher who ate wild honey and whose clothes was rough clothes there was nothing great about him outwardly 
But he had the Spirit of God, and he had God's blessing, and he was God's man to prepare the people for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he proclaimed to them that in order that they might receive Christ, they had to repent. And this was truly a, a remarkable, novel message to the Jews because they thought that in some sense that the kingdom of God was for them. It was only for them. And simply the Messiah had to appear and suddenly they would be translated into the kingdom of God. But no, whose fan is in his hand and he will thoroughly purge his floor, that's his church, and gather his wheat into the garner, his true people, but he will burn up with chaff the unquenchable fire. Who are the chaff? The chaff are the hangers-on. The chaff are the people that, are, that were filling the temple and filling the synagogues. But they didn't know the power of God. They knew nothing of godliness. They knew nothing what it was to be a true-hearted believer. They were chaff. And the time was coming for the end of them. He was going to destroy the church, the Jewish church as it was. And we know his words ultimately were fulfilled. For in AD 70, Jerusalem and the temple and the organized religion of the day was shattered when the Romans came and took the city. This parable that we're going to look at tonight is in the same vein. It really is in the same theme. And initially, it's talking about the state of the Jewish church at the time of Christ. Well, we're a long way away from the Jewish church at the time of Christ. Here we are, some 2,000 years since these words were uttered. And we would be foolish in the extreme if we confined this word and the application of it to the Jewish church. If we are wise, because the Word of God is living and active, and it's bang up to date, it is contemporary like no other book is. It speaks to the minister tonight. It speaks to the office bearer tonight. It speaks to the member of the church tonight. It speaks to the adherent. It speaks to the unbeliever. It speaks to us all. It has a message. And the message is all about the barren fig tree. A fig tree that did not bear fruit. There are three things, friends, that I wish to highlight with you. Seeking the Lord's help and blessing. Three very brief things from these four verses for our edification tonight. First of all, we want to notice the highly favoured. The highly favoured. In our society today, and I'm simply saying this to introduce the subject to you. In our society today, there are people who think that they have been highly favoured and others have not. This is a culture that, that is dominating or a mindset that's dominating the culture today. Many people can complain about their social standing, the colour of their skin, their sex or whatever. And they look at others and they say, Oh, they are highly privileged. They have light skin or white skin. And they have an advantage over others who don't share the same tone of skin. Here we have some who were highly favoured. What do I mean? Well, look at what it says in verse 6. When he spoke this parable... A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. Here we have a fig tree planted in his vineyard. A vineyard was a very special place. It would have the best of ground. It would be well attended. And here there was a fig tree in the vineyard. This would not be normal. 
This would not be common. You don't plant a fig tree in a vineyard. And here, what do we have here? We have something that was highly favoured. And yes, we could go back to the Jews and recognise that they were highly favoured. They were a highly favoured nation. God bestowed upon the Jews blessings that he did not bestow upon the Gentiles. God was gracious to them. God was using them to bring salvation to the world. For salvation is of the Jews. And because of this, God had chosen them. God had provided for them. God had protected them. God had given them the scriptures, the covenants, the prophets. Purity of worship, divine worship, while other nations were left in their sins and left in their debauchery and left in their idolatry. Yet God had poured many, many blessings upon the Jewish nation. But let's end the Jewish nation here and now and let us look at ourselves. Are we not a blessed nation? Are we not a blessed people? Is it not true, friends, that we have blessings that others do not have? Even in the 21st century, there are many people who will live and they will die. They will live and live good and full lives. And they will experience many of the blessings of this world. But they will never have the gospel proclaimed to them. They might never have the word of God in their language. They might never know the gospel. They might never know about the Lord Jesus Christ. They will come out of the womb and they will go into the tomb and they will never hear of the Lord Jesus. But blessings upon blessings, privileges upon privileges have been lavished out upon all here within these walls. And of course we can extend it to this nation which has turned its back upon the living God. Yet it is true. To hear the gospel, to be under the means of the gospel, to hear someone pray for you, to hear the word of God read and explained and expanded and applied is a wonderful privilege. It is an inestimable blessing and is not to be despised. And you, in some sense, are highly favoured. We're all highly favoured. What resources we have? We have a Bible. Who wants a Bible today? The Bible is God's Word. We all have it. Any one of us can go and buy a Bible. We can go and buy another Bible. We have it on our phones. We have it on our, our computers. We have sermons upon sermons. Our libraries are full of books. Good books telling us the truth as it is in Jesus. We have so much resources and therefore, friends, we are truly highly favoured. We are like this fig tree who was planted in the vineyard and you can be sure the vine dresser would look after everything in the vineyard. No excuse. Highly favoured. Well, secondly, the Lord looks for fruit. If again we go to that verse 6, and if we see the second part of it, and he came and sought fruit thereon and found none. This is something we have to take on board. This is something the minister has to take on board. This is something that congregations have to take on board. So often and for so long, this mindset may well be in us that is in some sense affecting our whole outlook concerning the preaching of God's Word. If we're honest, if we're honest with ourselves, when we go forth to preach the gospel, do we expect results? Do we expect conversions? Do we expect transformations? Do we expect the people to be built up in their most holy faith? Well, we might not. And we might say to ourselves, we're living in days of small things. And somehow this may comfort us. But maybe it should not, because what do we find here? 
A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard and he came and sought fruit thereon. He was looking for results. He was looking for fruit. And friends, he should receive fruit. Who ever heard of a tree that did not bear fruit that should be bearing fruit? He went. He looked. He was expecting fruit. Why? Because it was planted in a good place. It was well looked after and cared for. And it was a right thing to expect fruit. It's exactly the same with the Lord our God. He's looking for fruit. He's looking for fruit in the congregation. Without exception. And we must ask ourselves, are we bearing fruit? We ask the people who are unbelievers, are you bearing fruit? Are you making use of the gospel? Are you calling upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ? You know, he came and sought fruit thereon. He may well have gone to the tree and he may well have found leaves. He may well have found some blossom. But that didn't satisfy him. He wanted fruit. And as he looks at a congregation, as he looks at members and adherents, this is what he's looking for. We may have the outward symbols of life in us, like blossom, like leaves. We might have the outward signs of Christianity, but God's looking for fruit. What's he looking for? He's looking for spiritual fruit. He's looking for a life that is in love with the Lord Jesus Christ. He's looking for a life that has been transformed and is being transformed. He's looking for repentance, as we spoke about earlier today. But he's looking for faith. He's looking for sanctification. He's looking for holiness. He's looking for a changed life. He's looking for a changed heart. He's looking for a changed tongue. He's looking for a changed behavior. That's what he's looking for. That's the fruit that he wants to see. And he's not concerned about our, our outward profession. We may have leaves, we may have blossom, and we may look somewhat good on the outside, but he's looking for the real thing. He's looking to the heart of the matter. He wants to know if the root of the matter is in us. Because the Lord is looking for fruit. And notice, friends, he did not look for much fruit. It doesn't say that. He was looking for fruit. He was looking for real evidence that the Spirit of God has entered into the heart of the individual. That the man or the woman or the boy and the girl know something about a spiritual resurrection. That there is truly new life in that individual. That's what he's looking for. We looked at the parable of the sower some time ago. And this is broadly similar. And we know that the only true evidence of a real Christian is to bear fruit. Some 30, some 60, some 100 fold. Not all Christians will be exactly the same in fruitfulness. There will be a, a variety as there is variety in persons. But this is one thing that unites all Christians. They will bear fruit. And this is what God looks for. And this is what God can expect. And nothing less than fruit will satisfy God. He found none. No figs. And this would remind us then, therefore, where God gives privileges, he's looking for a return. We could think of the businessman he buys a, a dilapidated business, a business that's maybe down and out, on its last legs. He buys it. He buys it at a good price. He surveys the market. He believes he can turn it around. He believes he can make it profitable. What does he do? He puts time. He puts effort. He puts energy into it. He will put capital into it. 
He may destroy some buildings. He may rebuild. He may refurbish. He'll do a lot of things as he sees fit. And it might take some time. It might take a year or two. It might be a much longer thing. It might be a ten year thing. It's, he's in it for the long term. But he puts his effort and his energy into it. And he's looking for a return. And the time will come when he sees a change. For years it, w it wasn't making any profit. But then there's a change. And his plans are beginning to bear fruition. And he's now seen a return. He's now getting a reward. And he delights to see his business prosper. In some sense, this is the way with the living God. He has put time and effort into the gospel. He has sent forth his son. His son has done everything required in order to purchase a salvation for a number that no man can number. And that all sinners, if they will but come to him, they will find grace. They will find their sins forgiven. They will know the, the, the new life. And this is what you hear. This is what you hear week after week. It doesn't matter if you hear it from me. You hear it from others. We may well... Speak differently. We may well present the gospel somewhat differently. Each minister has their own way of expressing themselves. But in, in essence, it's the same gospel. And some of you have been here for years and for decades. And as far as we can ascertain, we are no judge. And we bless God for that. We're not judging anyone but as far as we can ascertain there's no fruit we thank God that all judgment has been committed under the Son and all that's required of the preacher is to be faithful and to declare Christ in all his fullness and to urge people that when you're under special privileges and blessings, that God is looking for fruit. He's looking for a return. To whom much is given, much is required. Now this applies not just to unbelievers. This applies to believers. Believers are to grow in grace. Believers are to bear fruit and you have to ask yourself are you barren or are you bearing because the Lord does look for fruit thirdly friends it's a very dangerous thing to be under the means of grace and not to bear fruit. It's dangerous to be unfruitful under great spiritual blessings. Verse 7 Then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree. And find none. Cut it down. Why cumbereth it the ground? Some commentators maintain that these three years mentioned is a reference to the, the public ministry of the Lord Jesus. Again, that would apply to the Jewish church. And it may well be a, a reference to his own ministry. For three years he went teaching and preaching. And he knew great success. But ultimately he was rejected. He came unto his own. And his own received him not. They were given time. To bear fruit. He has come seeking fruit. And they found none. When he came. The Jewish church. Was in a desperate condition. It was barely distinguishable from the Gentile nations around them. 
and he found none. And he said, cut it down. And we know that that word was fulfilled. It was cut down when the Romans came. But what do we find? And the, the dresser, the person who looked after the vineyard, in verse 8, he answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I shall dig about it and dung it. He recognized there was a problem. This fig tree wasn't bearing fruit. But he says, I'll give it some special attention. Maybe he, in some sense, he was admitting that maybe he hadn't looked upon this uh, fig tree as much as he should have. Maybe he had neglected it. He had other work to do. And maybe he had bypassed it. But he said, I'll give it some attention. I'll dig around it. I'll fertilize it in modern words. I'll water it. Put some fertilizer in it. And we'll see what will happen after a year. And if it bears fruit after a year, then well, if not, then cut it down. So what was he going to do to that fig tree? He was going to pay some attention to it. He was going to, in some sense, stir it up. He was going to shake the ground about it. He was going to give it some attention and stir it up. This is what God does. When he sees unfruitful people under the means of grace or despising the means of grace or despising the gospel or despising and rejecting the Savior, what does he do? He stirs up people. He makes them in some sense uncomfortable. He does that by providence. And that's why I read the earlier verses in, in Luke chapter 13 because that's what we find here. That's exactly what we find here. There are two instances that are referred to. And I don't need to highlight them. Verse 1. Whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. What happened to these Galileans? Well, whatever happened to these Galileans, it should have been a warning to people. Here were people who were sacrificing, who were in an act, a religious act. And Pilate killed them as they were offering their sacrifices. And instead of wondering where these people, great sinners, they should look at these events and they should learn something from them. What should they learn? They should learn that life is short. And one day life shall end. And it ended very violently and very abruptly for these people there. And they should take a lesson they should realize that one day we will go. One day we'll not hear the gospel. One day we'll not be able to repent. One day no one will pray for you. One day it will be you and God. What is the other event? Verse 4. Jesus says, What about these eighteen upon whom the tower in Siloam fell and slew them? There's another tragedy. There's another thing that happened by the mystery of providence. We don't know why these things happen, but we can learn from it. What are we to learn? Life is short. It's brief. This is the day of grace. This is the hour to get right with God. This is when we're under the means of grace and Christ is offered to you in the gospel. This is the opportunity that God in his providence has laid before you that you might embrace the Savior and have your sins forgiven. This is how we should look upon these things. A sudden death in the family. A terminal illness. The loss of a friend. These things should remind us that we're on a journey. And we only have today to get right with God. But you might think that the Lord only uses these tragedies to awaken us. But that's not the case. 
If we go back to the Jews again, if we use them as an example, in chapter 2 of Romans, Paul had outlined and at the end of chapter 1 how the, the Gentiles were guilty. And in case the Jews would get big-headed and think that somehow the gospel did not ap apply to them, in chapter 2 of Romans, there Paul outlines to the Jews that they are just as guilty as the Gentiles and they need the gospel just as much. And one verse that we can quote from chapter 2 of Romans, verse 4, he's talking about the Jews. Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? Here's another turn. Here's another way that God has been pricking people's conscience in some sense. Look how God has lavished upon the Jews wonderful blessings. His goodness, his forbearance, his long suffering that he has exercised towards the Jewish nation. And all of these things are to lead them to repentance. We can easily put ourselves in that verse, friends. We're not Jews, but we have been blessed like the Jews. Blessings. God in his goodness, his forbearance, his long suffering. You know, in verse 8 here, we do believe this is a picture of the intercession of Christ. God, if you like, is the master who has planted his vineyard and the fig tree in the vineyard. He wants to cut it down. But the dresser, Christ, says, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I shall dig about it and dung it. What's he saying? There are people at the means of grace in the house of God and God is saying, cut it down. Their day is over. They've had their opportunity. And Christ is saying, no. More time. Give them a year. And if they bear fruit, well. If not, then cut them down. Sobering. Very, very sobering, friends. But there's something else we need to notice here in this parable. The barren fig tree was an obstacle in the vineyard. What does it say? Verse 7. This is, if you like, the, the owner's view and opinion of the, of the fig tree. Why cumbereth it the ground? Why are we giving space to this fig tree? Here's my vineyard. This fig tree has got a privilege. It's in my vineyard. It's not bearing fruit. It's taking up space. I could have a, a, a vine tree pl planted in its place and it would bear fruit. It is cumbering the ground. Cut it down. In my last charge, I had to conduct the funeral of a, of a man who was diligent in some respects at the means of grace. He lived an exemplary life. You couldn't fault his life. He never made a profession of faith. I certainly can't judge 
his position before God. I never would. But when the funeral came, I believe I preached the gospel. And someone said later on, you always have hope for someone under the means of grace. And to some extent, that is true. But this parable would tell something different. If someone is not bearing fruit and they're under the means of grace, they are an obstacle. That's what he's saying. The minister loves <coughs> to have people in the, in the means of grace, all young, old, doesn't matter. He loves to preach to all. But to be under the means of grace is not enough. We must be bearing fruit. What are we talking about? Well, we're talking about the fruit of the Spirit, of course. Love, joy, peace, long sufferingness, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such things there is no law. We could summarize it by saying a Christ-like life. Yes, it includes repentance that we noticed this morning, but that's not all. There's to be faith. There is to be faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. This is part of conversion. There are two elements. It's to repent and to believe the gospel. It's to turn away from our sins and it's to live a new life, a life of faith. And we are to grow in faith and we are to exhibit the gift and the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. We have to show evidence that Christ is in us. The hope of glory is truly in us. And we are to bear fruit and that's what the Lord looks for. And he will have. And if he doesn't, why cumbereth it the ground? Why cumbereth it the ground? Cut it down. Where are we then tonight? Here was a barren fig tree, soon to be cut off. Let us be careful then that we do bear fruit. And how can we possibly bear fruit? Well, we can't do it ourselves. We must go to the Lord Jesus Christ. John, what did he say? I indeed baptize with water, but there cometh one after me who is mightier than I. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. You must go to him. You must have dealings with the Lord Jesus Christ. You can't bear this fruit in of yourself. You must go to him. Faith cometh by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. And hearing is to lead us and to draw us that we might apply unto Christ. And friends, if we go to Christ, we will bear fruit. We will not be barren. We will bear fruit 30, 60, or 100. Amen. And may God bless his word to us. Let us pray together.